Uh, my name is Lawrence Halpern. I'm the head of the Division of Gastroenterology at St. Paul's. And it's a delight to see you all, all come out. The first one of these uh, four uh, was many years ago, and I had the pleasure of doing that one with Carl Brown, who is a colorectal surgeon. And it's been a long time since I've done one anyway. So as you know, these four are held the third Wednesday of every month, and there's a different topic. Uh, the next topic is also going to be done by the Gastroenterology Division, and it's going to be on liver disease by Dr. Alno Ramji and our newest recruit, uh, Dr. Hin Hin Ko. So for the forum tonight, uh, we will pass out, most of you picked out some uh, uh, small paper. You can write questions down, which I'll try to interpret, and we'll ask Jennifer uh, to answer. The next session is October the 19th, same place, and it's on liver disease. And a great, a great pleasure to introduce Jennifer to those of you who don't know her. I see Alice Reed there, and Alice knows her. Um, Jennifer is one of our younger colleagues, and we we're delighted that we were able to recruit her. She graduated from uh, UBC in 1992 with her Bachelor of Science degree in Honors Physiology, most of which I'm just finding out now by looking at this anyway. <laughs> so her, uh, the part about her MD in Internal Medicine Residency at UBC I'm well familiar with since she worked with us at that time and did a gastroenterology fellowship at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Harvard uh, Medical School, which all of you know is not only famous, but in Boston. She completed a master's in public health at Harvard as well, and a focus on clinical effectiveness and advanced endoscopy fellowship. And she is one of the Canadian experts in endoscopic ultrasound, which we will not be talking about tonight. She is a clinical associate professor of medicine uh, at UBC and a member of the Division of Gastroenterology here. And uh, we're delighted that she's also now the medical director of Colon Cancer Check, which is the British Columbia Cancer Agency's, uh, and I think to some extent St. Paul's Hospital, uh, colon cancer screening pilot project, which uh, Jennifer will discuss with you. And without uh, too much further ado, I'll introduce you to Jennifer, and I'll go sit down and get out of your way. Thanks, Laurie. Hi. Okay, so uh, as Laurie said, tonight I'm going to give you a little bit of information about uh, colorectal cancer, and I apologize if some is redundant. I wanted to keep it quite general so that um, people who uh, weren't familiar with colorectal cancer could get some background information, and then discuss how important it is to screen for colorectal cancer. Uh, address uh, who should be screened, who's eligible for screening, and who should be thinking about screening for this, what sort of tests are available for screening, what's happening with uh, colorectal cancer screening in British Columbia, and then finally what you can do to, to try and prevent uh, developing colorectal cancer. So um, the colon, the rectum, the colon is also referred to as a large intestine or the large bowel or other, uh, or, or other terms referring to the colon. And it's a really common cancer worldwide, really, particularly in uh, Western societies. And it's the second leading cause in British Columbia of cancer in men and the third leading cause of cancer in women. But it's the second leading cause of, of cancer death after lung cancer. And in British Columbia, three, three people are diagnosed every day with colorectal cancer. So, so it is very common. And many of you may know someone who's been diagnosed with colorectal cancer. You can't hear me? Is that a bit better? OK. So this is a diagram showing the colon and the rectum as uh, they rest in the abdominal cavity. And you can see there is about 30 feet of small intestine in between the stomach. And then it, the small intestine goes into the colon and finally the rectum. And uh, the colon and the rectum are the areas of the, the intestinal tract that have a high tendency to developing cancer. The small intestine is, is a rare organ to develop uh, cancer in. And so the screening is really focused to the colon and rectum. So colorectal cancer development in almost all cases occurs with development of a precancerous lesion called a polyp, and particularly a polyp called an adenoma, which refers to the what it look what the what the cells look like to the pathologist when they look at the samples that we give them, and then from that polyp it can develop into cancer, and. Uh, the cancer then usually develops in the, does develop in the lining of the colon, and then over time can slowly progress through the layers of the wall of the colon, and that refers to the different stages of colon cancer. And obviously the larger it grows, the more invasive it becomes into the wall, the more difficult it is to treat. 
the, the most important points about this slide that I want to stress is through that time when you have a polyp and even with early stages of colon cancer, there may be absolutely no symptoms. And that's why it's so important to screen because you, you this development most of the time takes many years to occur. Um, and without screening, uh, you may end up in a situation where you're diagnosing all of your colon cancers when it's much more difficult to treat them. And we know that if colon cancer is diagnosed early, when it's just limited to that inner lining of the bowel wall, that the, the cure rate is over 90%, which is excellent. So as far as why screen for colon cancer? So as I just suggested, screening involves doing testing on people who don't have any symptoms, looking for um, uh, preclinical indicators that they may have a cancer and, and need further investigations. And reasons to screen for colon cancer is because it is very common in BC. And we know that if you detect it at this earlier stage before it may have symptoms, then you decrease the need for chemotherapy or radiation therapy, decrease the need for having a bag related to the surgery, a colostomy, and you decrease death due to colon cancer. In addition, by detecting these precancerous polyps in the colon, if those are detected and removed at colonoscopy, then that can prevent colon cancer from ever developing, so from ever getting it in the first place. So the number one risk factor for getting colon cancer is increasing age. Colon cancer is very rare before the age of 50. It does occur, unfortunately, but it's quite rare. So we start screening people when they turn 50. Typically, screening programs that look at a population screen people between the ages of 50 and 75. Sure, people can get colon cancer after they are 75 and over, and screening at that point is sort of based on an individual basis. So screening is really meant for people who are in reasonably good health. If, if people have a lot of other medical conditions, then screening may not be appropriate uh, because the tests for follow-up uh, could be, um, the complication rates could be too high to sort of warrant the benefit that they may achieve. Achieve. People who are at increased risk of colon cancer include those who have a family history of colon cancer. And the family history that's important here is family history and first degree relatives. So parents, siblings, children who develop colon cancer, those are the ones that pretend the greatest risk to individuals, and particularly if they were diagnosed at a younger age, meaning less than 50, less than 60. Uh, in addition, the risk is higher, obviously, if there's more than if there's many first degree relatives rather than just the one. If you have a personal history of having had colon cancer, then you should be in a surveillance program to detect pre the development of polyps in the future and prevent cancer in the future. And if you've had a personal history of having had one of these precancerous polyps and adenoma removed from your colon, then a follow-up colonoscopy in the future might be appropriate. In addition, individuals who've had uh, inflammatory bowel disease, so ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease involving the colon, are at increased risk of colon cancer. And that risk may come at a younger age. We talked about colon cancer really starting at age 50. Well, in these individuals, it really depends on when they were diagnosed and started developing the inflammation. So typically about 10 years, depending on the extent of disease, 8 to 12 years, but on average 10 years after the diagnosis is when they should be seeing a, a gastroenterologist about getting screening done. So there's a variety of different tests that are used to screen for colon cancer, and you know some of these have been in the media, or you may have had some, or had friends who've had some. But uh, the most common test is a stool test that looks for hidden blood in the stool. And we know that cancers uh, tend to bleed, and this detects hidden blood in the stool and can be an indicator that there may be a cancer or a precancerous lesion. And there's two that are currently available in British Columbia. One is a guaiac uh, chemical test for fecal occult blood, and that's one that's really been traditionally available uh, in BC. And a, a new test called a FIT, which stands for Fecal Immunochemical Test. And uh, that's been approved by Health Canada for just over two years now, and is the test that's used in the colon cancer screening program that I'll be discussing with you in a moment. Flexible sigmoidoscopy colonoscopy and CT colonography, also sometimes called virtual colonoscopy. So with the fecal occult blood test, as I mentioned, they're used to detect hidden blood in the stool. It's, you know, a safe test. There's no risk of it. And it's done in the comfort of your own home. If it's normal, it's repeated every one to two years. And if it's abnormal, then a colonoscopy is recommended to follow that up. If you have an abnormal test indicating that there is hidden blood in the stool, that doesn't automatically mean you have cancer. There's a lot of other reasons for that. It just means that you need that follow-up test. So it isn't something to become alarmed about. Just realize that you do, you know, you need to have further investigations. 
So with the traditional guaiac FLBT, that's one where you do six specimens uh, from the stool. It's um, a bit less user-friendly in that there is dietary and medication restrictions that you need to do for a few days preceding uh, completing the test because they can cause false positive or false negative results with the test. It's available for free for all British Columbians, and you can get it from your family doctor. The fecal immunochemical test, or the FIT, um, can be one or two samples. It's a bit easier to use. There's no dietary and medication restrictions. It's not available widely in British Columbia as of yet. As part of the colon check program, it's free for participants. And also, um, one of the uh, private lab companies has it available for $30 for one, one, one uh, sample. In uh, clinical studies, research has shown that it's easier to use, and because of that, compliance is better with it. People tend, tend to do it more when it's recommended. And it's also uh, much more accurate at detecting both cancer and the precancerous polyps than the traditional guaiac test is. So it's a very exciting change for colon cancer screening in BC. The flexible sigmoidoscopy is a video camera examination. It examines the rectum and the lower colon. And if it's normal, the recommendation is to repeat it every five to 10 years for colon cancer screening. If it's abnormal, then a colonoscopy is again recommended. If they find a polyp on flexible sigmoidoscopy, then we want to look through the rest of the colon uh, because this is a colon that grows polyps. And we should see if there's any further up. It's uh, typically an enema preparation, um, but some, some places will recommend an oral uh, lavage where you have to drink a laxative. Usually no sedation is given for it, um, which is good in that you can get right back to your normal life. You can drive afterwards, but have some downsides if it's, if it's uncomfortable and you don't have the benefits of sedation for that. Very low complication rate. Typically requires referral to a specialist, either a gastroenterologist or a general surgeon, in order to have it done. Colonoscopy, similar to flexible sigmoidoscopy, again a video camera examination of the colon that looks at the entire colon. And uh, the benefits of colonoscopy is while you're doing it, you can remove adenomas, you can take samples of cancer, so you can do therapy and diagnostics at the same time. It does require fairly intensive oral preparation. Sedation is generally given for colonoscopy, um, so you aren't able to drive or work following the procedure. Of the screening test, it has the highest complication rate in the literature. It's about 1 in 250, um, but in expert hands, much less than that. It does require referral to a specialist in order to have it done. And if it's normal, the if it's normal and someone's of average risk, then usually the interval for screening is then every 10 years. CT colonography is an x-ray test, you, a CT scan that evaluates the entire colon. This requires, again, a pretty intensive um, uh, oral bowel preparation. There is radiation exposure uh, with that, although not, not to, very high. No sedation is given, which again has the benefits of being able to go back to work, but the test can be uncomfortable and uh, a very low complication rate. If normal, the re current recommendations are to repeat in five years, and if it's abnormal, then a colonoscopy should be done if they see polyps on that and want them removed. In terms of screening in British Columbia, right now throughout BC we refer to the screening as being opportunistic. So screening isn't sort of equally available to all British Columbians. It really relies on a motivated patient asking about it or a physician discussing it with the patient. But it isn't something that's you know, generally available the way with screening mammography, you can get a letter in the mail, that sort of thing. Um, programmatic screening, on the other hand, um, looks at evaluating a whole population and providing equal access uh, information education to um, citizens uh, regarding screening. And uh, the BC Cancer Agency, with the uh, Ministry of Health funding, has begun a uh, programmatic colon cancer screening program in British Columbia called Colon Check. It was initially designed as a pilot program to develop the infrastructure and processes for a program and then was field tested in three communities, Penticton, Powell River, and the downtown Vancouver core. The eligible participants were those ages 50 to 75 years in those communities and the screening was uh, using the fecal immunochemical test. And the, um, the pilot completed as of the end of March and the proposal is before the Ministry of Health for funding to roll out province-wide. In terms of opportunistic screening, there are recommendations that were created in 2004. Um, the BC recommendations are currently under review. We just had our first meeting last week. The recommendations from 2004 recommended that for individuals who did not have a family history of colorectal cancer, that doing the fecal occult blood test uh, every year or having a sigmoidoscopy every five to 10 years was appropriate screening. 
for individuals who have a first degree relative with colon cancer, it was recommended that they have a colonoscopy as their primary screening test because they were considered at higher risk and that that could be done every five to ten years depending on the findings. This is a diagram that just goes over again the programmatic screening. And um, just in terms of the, uh, the principles of col colon cancer screening in a programmatic perspective, again, that it's accessible to all British Columbians. And we have uh, recruitment methods for educating and inviting people to participate. They undergo the screening test that we provide uh, through the program access to follow up. So one of the barriers to colon cancer screening right now in BC is that family doctors can give the fecal occult blood test, but they're understandably concerned when they have their patients come back with a positive test and they find it difficult to arrange sometimes the follow-up colonoscopy, which is obviously really anxiety-provoking for, for all involved. So doing programmatic screening, that would be one of the, the principles of that, is that you could, you could get timely colonoscopy follow-up for people who had the abnormal stool test. And then that there would be quality assurance um, around both the colonoscopy that's done in terms of safety and accuracy, and also around the pathology that's taken, so any polyps that are removed or cancers that are biopsies, that there's quality standards around there. Uh, ensuring that um, that the diagnoses are accurate, that communication um, regarding the, the patient's results are relayed back to their primary care physicians as well as to the patient, complications are monitored for, and then the effectiveness of the program. Obviously, if you're putting money into a program like this, you want to see long term that you are preventing cancers and preventing deaths from cancers, and that the participants are satisfied with the process and, and how it is. So uh, colon cancer screening is very timely right now. As you can see, um, all of the provinces in Canada have uh, instituted province-wide screening programs or are in the process of um, uh, starting up uh, smaller pilot programs as we are anticipating uh, to roll out province-wide. The first program that um, started was Ontario in 2007, and uh, Dr. Rabinick, who uh, who uh, w was running the program at the time, came and talked to us. And it was very big news in Ontario, made the front page. But the Ministry of Health had made the announcement the same day that the Picton trial started here in BC. So it didn't get on the front page here. And I think it was on page three of our province. But. So you may have missed it. Uh, colon check principles. I mentioned equitable access. We want to identify participants that are higher risk. The, um, one of the core concepts of the program is that we have this nurse navigator and this is someone who's based in the community and participants who are identified as having an abnormal fecal test and need a colonoscopy see the nurse navigator, sit down with her, she can educate them around the stool test, what's involved with colonoscopy, what's involved with the bowel preparation and books them for colonoscopy and then does a 30-day phone call to relay the results, what the follow-up recommendations are and assess, you know, whether the participant was satisfied with the program and whether any complications occurred as a result of having had the colonoscopy. Um, and then as I mentioned, the colonoscopy pathology quality standards and then really trying to provide this seamless, um, this uh, seamless follow-up for the participant right from the time they register for the colon through their colonoscopy and then if um, if they're they do develop cancer making sure they have all the appropriate staging and following them right up to their first treatment with cancer whether it's chemotherapy or a surgery so for the colon check overview as mentioned we had Ministry of Health funding in July of 2008 and it began uh, the pilot program in these uh, three uh, three communities to date we have uh, 9,300 participants and have uh, had just over 8,000 of the fecal occult kits returned. 700 uh, have been abnormal. The positivity rate is approximately 8%. And we completed uh, over 1,000 colonoscopies and diagnosed 21 cancers. So this is uh, you know, approximately double what you would expect in a general population. So we, we are certainly diagnosing more cancers uh, through the program than you, than you would uh, typically see. And the majority of these cancers um, have been early stage, as opposed to when you diagnose people outside of a screening program, so when people are presenting with rectal bleeding or symptoms of colon cancer, typically the stage of diagnosis is more advanced. So, you know, we can certainly anticipate that we're going to have benefit to the participants in terms of decreasing uh, the intensity of therapy and also mortality from colon cancer. So in terms of preventing colon cancer, we've talked a lot about colon cancer screening, which was the, the um, 
topic of this, but obviously being able to, there are some lifestyle, some risk factors that can be modified, and certainly uh, smoking, um, alcohol intake, obesity, and a diet that's high in red meat, low in fiber, low in fruits, low in vegetables, all of these factors in large cohort studies have been associated with the development of colon polyps and colon cancer. So these are all, you know, sort of common sense things for general health and apply to a variety of medical conditions, but I'll just reiterate them in terms of colon cancer. And then again, just being a motivated patient patient and talking to your doctor when you turn 50 about getting screened for colon cancer. Thank you very much.